Okay, next up is Eric Kalendra. And Eric is a postdoc researcher at George Mason University, and his background is actually in mathematics and statistics, so he is not quite sure what to make of people like us. <laughs> and <laughs> today he is going to be, uh, he's going to be talking to us about predictive modeling for determining the discriminative power of trace glass evidence as a function of the number of sampled glass fragments. Thank you. Uh, as she said, yes, I'm a statistician and not quite a uh, forensic. A, uh, let's see here. What was the shortcut? There we go. So yes, I'm talking about the predictive modeling uh, for determining the discriminant power of trace glass evidence um, through the number of fragments you've sampled. Uh, so this is going to be a little bit of a different presentation based on the past few because I have no spectra in my presentation whatsoever. So I uh, have to first go through the simple disclaimer since I have a, a Chris Saunders, which is a researcher with an NIJ grant, which was supported partially. So this doesn't actually uh, you know, go through and it's just the standard. To my opinion, does not reflect on the grant. And also thank you to Joanne for trying to get me up to speed on background for the XRF uh, and the trace evidence. So basically, I'm using XRF, which has been explained many times. Uh, probably everyone in the room knows better than I do. Uh, now, important for statistics, we have to define a couple things uh, for the control and you know the alternative hypotheses. So I'm going to be using the idea that the that there's two locations that glass is recovered from. Uh, primarily ones from the crime scene, which we're going to call the control, and one on suspects, which is going to be the recovered fragments. Uh, so this, you know, is the two hypotheses. Uh, basically, we'd like to either say that the glass fragments come from the, from the same source or they come from two different sources. Uh, and so Based on some methods like the Hollings T squared statistic, which some of you may be familiar with, we place an assumption that the different elemental composition, well, actually the, ratio, the log ratios, is uh, multivariate normal. And so what I'm going to be doing is using a full Bayesian procedure to talk about the uh, posterior distribution. And then we're going to be able to estimate the basically the discriminant power between those two hypotheses. And so this is actually a two-level normal model, which is a hierarchical model. Uh, I'll go into details on that, as probably not everyone here has, has seen it before. Uh, this approach is, is allowing us to do a proctor characterization that is assuming certain assumptions, namely the two-level normal model. Uh, this is a little bit different than the procedures, like overlaying the two spectras. And essentially, the way I'm going to be carrying this out is by using glass database, which I'm not going to be talking about the number of comparisons just within the database. I'm actually going to be talking about generating new differences if we believe the assumptions that we're assuming are true. So I'll explain that a little bit further as well. And basically, I'm going to be giving a Monte Carlo method. Uh, so this is in order to estimate the covariance matrices because the posterior distributions can't be quantified in a simple form. So I'll also provide details on how that's done. So the glass measurements, uh, as I said, I'm not using spectra, so I actually have, I got the data from a, an Aiken and Lucy paper that was published a couple years ago. And so what I'm looking at is three ratios uh, standardized by calcium, uh, so I have potassium, silicone, and iron. And so I'm going to be treating as a multivariate vector, which, uh, so basically our, wow, I can't see the laser pointer at all, probably because it's red. So um, I'm using the, uh, the three uh, data points uh, as a multivariate vector. And the data I have is 30 windows, which were, have five fragments from each window sampled. So we have a grand total of 150 fragments. And now 
as I said, we have five observations per window, but I'll be discussing the sample sizes in terms of general numbers because we want to talk about the predictive distributions, you know, using this data to train on. And so just to, to look at this data in a different way, uh, if we plot this in a three-dimensional plot, uh, we see that this data does seem to follow a kind of a ridge pattern in the middle. So there is some uh, association between the different elements. Now, can we argue if this is exactly multivariate normal? Most likely, it's not exactly right. However, if you ever are going to use a Hollings t squared statistic, you're essentially assuming this is true. So I'm going to talk about if you assume this is true, what can we expect the consequences to be and what kind of power can we basically obtain if we use that procedure? So the two-level normal model. Essentially, a two-level normal model uh, has normal distributions uh, put on two different pieces. And the pieces here are, first of all, if we think about we're sampling from windows, we're going to assume that all windows in our population have a mean uh, that follows a normal distribution. So basically, there, you know, in statistics, we like to view an infinite population, and this population has, follows a normal distribution, and we can assume that windows are sampled from this distribution. Now, once we fix a window, the second level is assuming that the, dis the distribution of shards that come from this window are also following a normal distribution. Now, these are multivariate normals because we have the three elements. But uh, this whole model is characterized by two covariance matrices. Uh, the actual window means are unobservable because we're actually observing them with error. Uh, the error here is assuming that you know, the window is not completely homogeneous, and your data collection method is also introducing some error. Now, because we're only going to be measuring each fragment from a window once, we can't dis discriminate between error associated with the machine or instrument uh, from the error brought in about by inhomogeneity of the window. So that's characterized by the sigma w, which is within a group, within a window. And then we have the sigma between, which I denote as the sigma b, which is talking about the variation between all windows in our population. So this is the distribution of means within our population. Now, these are point-wise averages calculated from the posterior uh, of the sampling, so these are not guaranteed to be covariance matrices due to averaging of covariance matrices not exactly equal to a semi-positive definite matrix. Uh, but the point here is on the sigma w, we see that it's essentially a diagonal matrix. Uh, so the way this notation is, is this is a, essentially, in this context, uh, you can think of it as a variance with, uh, in the parentheses, a standard deviation. Now, as you can see, the standard deviations are almost as big or bigger than the actual variances that are calculated, and the reason for that is, uh, you know, variances have a hard wall at zero. They can't go less than zero, so when they always have a heavy right tail, or typically have heavy right tails, when we're dealing with small variances. And what this is telling us is that if you just pick the best fit covariance matrix when you're doing calculations, there is actually a wide variety of possible covariance structures that could have taken place if you picked a new database. And in order to get this discrepancy measure, I'm going to actually be taking that variation into account. Uh, the important part to note that I was getting to is the fact that because we have a diagonal matrix on the sigma w, this is saying that the, the error from the instrument and the error from the window, so the variation within a window and the variation introduced by the instrument, is essentially making the elements relatively independent. So we, don't, we aren't seeing strong correlations due to the instrument, and we're not seeing strong correlations within a window from the mean. So it's uh, interesting. And then our between matrix, as I said, actually has a pretty strong correlation structure. Now, again, estimating covariance matrices is actually really a difficult problem. So even with uh, the number of windows we have, which is 30, that's not really that large of a sample to estimate the between covariance structure. 
which is going to introduce quite a large amount of variation. So when we are talking about dealing with differences, we're talking about actually looking at the means, the difference of means between the two windows. So we, the way we do this is, you know, typically you take the average of all the fragments from one, and you take the average of all the fragments of the other, and you take the difference. So I denote that as the difference. And uh, if the two, all the fragments come from the same window, we see that the distribution is only dependent upon the within covariance structure. So this will be important when we actually want to do our hypothesis testing. And if the two sets of fragments come from different windows, now we're going to have a larger variation because that difference depends on the between covariance structure, as well as the within covariance structure. And the other important feature is that we have the 1 over ki and 1 over ki prime, which is the sample size of each of the two samples. So it's the number of fragments you have from each sample. And that's going to determine how fast that structure uh, decreases. I mean, so it's one, so this is in terms of variance. So it might be, you might be used to seeing a 1 over a square root. Uh, so that's for, would be for standard deviation. In terms of variance, you just have 1 over the sample size. In this case, it's 1 over the first sample size plus 1 over the second. So there's a slight problem if you only have one shard from your suspect, that's going to limit how much information you can obtain when you're doing the comparison. Uh, and then if you're curious, if you actually know the within covariance structure that conveniently follows a chi-square distribution, but uh, that would just be used in order to set the, uh, the error rate or the type one error rate, so your faults uh, rejection rate or Right, and Hollings T-square, if you've seen it before, this is the, uh, the, the metric that's used. So essentially, this metric is only dependent upon your within covariance structure, or well, the inverse of it. Um, and you would set the a tau in order to fix your type one error. Uh, but again, we aren't exactly sure what the covariance structure is, but you know, Hollings T-square provides a convenient method in order to basically go through and set that tau value. And so that provides a convenient framework to move forward. And so I was saying that we're actually using a Monte Carlo method. Um, so which means, since it is Bayesian as well, we have to define some priors. Now, covariant structures, the best prior to use is inverse uh, Wishart, because that ensures that your covariant structures are positive definite. Uh, you can use a, uh, basically an improper prior, which is essentially uh, a zero matrix that's typically not used because you can introduce numerical instability, so you'll provide, you know, some sort of covariant structure that will provide a very small effective sample size introduction to the problem. Uh, by small, that depends on how many samples you actually have, and so this would be relative to the database that you're actually using. Now the overall norm, the overall mean, which I denote as eta, uh, that would normally be set as a normal distribution with a very small precision, or you can think of it as a very large variance. Uh, basically, improper priors in this case are effective because, you know, if you have a large number of shards, you don't have to really worry about having numerical instabilities. So these will influence the results a little bit. If you use the improper priors, it won't, but you might end up with numerical instability issues. Uh, now the simulation I'm going to be working with is actually trying to take into account the uncertainty that's involved with these covariance matrices. I'm not so much worried about the mean, so I'm just going to simulate the differences directly. So I'm actually you know, removing the effect of the mean. and. To do this, what I'm going to do is, for various numbers of fragments, I'll randomly select a number of covariance structures. So I'll randomly select so many within and so many between. Now, for the, that's where the MCMC -MC procedure comes in, because once the chains converge, we know that the covariance matrices are being sampled from the posterior. So they'll show up with the correct probability that we need them to for the amount of information that we've learned from the samples. Uh, so I select 1,000 of these. Uh, just for the sake of how much time it takes to do these things. Uh, 
And then I'll generate 10,000 differences under these sets of covariance structures. Now, as I said before, we have two different hypotheses. So we can actually, first of all, estimate uh, the error rate when we select uh, the differences under the condition that they do come from the same window. And then we can estimate the power when we know that the two samples or the, or the simulated differences come from two different windows. And so uh, I'm going to be focusing on the case where we have the same number of fragments in both. Uh, I realize after coming here that may not be the most practical assumption ever, but this can be easily modified to whichever situation you want to use. Uh, so basically the simulation results before I show a plot that summarizes is that the more fragments you have, the more confident you're going to get. I mean, that's basically because you're going to be able to estimate uh, the actual means of each group better, which means the differences will have more, will have better approximations. Uh, and then also, this is going to be a method to basically calculate a sample size under these given conditions. So if you know you only have the ability to sample so many fragments, then we can estimate the power, or if you want a sufficient power level, in order to make a decision, I, we can try to estimate how many fragments are going to be required in order to accomplish that. So th this is a summary. Um, it's kind of like an ROC curve, but since I have uh, point-wise error rates calculated, it's not quite the same. Uh, so moving from left to right, we have one fragment in each group, five fragments in each group, and nine fragments in each group. Uh, on the x-axis is the type 1 error rate going from 0 to 20%. And then on the vertical axis, we have the power of a decision. The uh, diagonal line going down is an equal error rate con condition. Uh, the vertical line going up is 5%, so that would be like a 95% confidence interval, or 95% confidence. And the horizontal line at the top there is a 95% power rate. So, or it should be slightly higher because this is a different uh, work. Uh, I've modified it slightly for this context. And what you can see is that as we have one fragment in each group, we essentially, first of all, are not getting very high uh, confident, or we're not, we're going to be making many errors on both sides is essentially what's going to be happening. Our error rate is pretty high, you know, uh, and our power is going to be pretty low, uh, which means if you want to be very confident that the two, frag or the two fragments actually came from the same group, that's not going to be very effective, and you're not going to be able to discriminate very well. Uh, as you get five and nine fragments, you see that the power estimates also, the uncertainty in the power decreases as well as your error rates decrease. So. Now, while you may not be able to sample nine from your suspect and nine from the control, you know, basically you can simulate for whichever situation you're in and actually estimate what situation you're going to be working with. And so the conclusions are, uh, basically, we need to take into account the uncertainty of the covariance matrix if you really want to get the, you know, if you really want real estimates. Because in a typical setting like Hollings T square, if you're using samples to estimate covariance structures, you need to re-estimate your entire database every time in order to get the true confidence rates that you're trying to convey. Now, that's pretty impractical. You can't go out and recollect a new database every time you want to make a conclusion. So a procedure that you takes the uncertainty into account is much more effective at accomplishing the goal of conveying what your true uncertainty really is. And so now understanding how the power changes is the other main goal, because if you want the weight of the evidence, the weight of the evidence is really a combination of how much power you have to discriminate and what the chances of making an error are. And But if you don't know how much power you have, then how can you really convey how how important the data you're showing off in court really is. 
And so this actually leads to a lot of future work because not only is this a very simple example, but this can be used in the context of any procedure that's used. So this is basically focusing on predictive distributions. If you want to use the fixed uh, covariance matrix estimate, we can also use the predictive distribution to evaluate biases or uncertainties that are introduced given that you don't actually know as much as you're claiming. Uh, and then, you know, moving forward as well, the metric I was talking about, which comes from the Hollings T-square, there's no reason why that has to be the only metric that is evaluated. We can come up with other metrics. For instance, this is for multivariate data. However, you know, you might be interested in breaking out only one element. So while the same metric can be used, there is other metrics that are also, that produce reasonable results or could possibly produce better results. Now, the reason why I say that is most of these methods don't take into account uncertainty. So evaluating the uncertainty of the method and the metric is also important moving forward. And so the reference I got the data from is the Aiken and Lucy paper from 2004. Probably everyone here is uh, familiar with it. And that concludes my presentation. <laughs>